Today we continue in the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. Listen for the word of God. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syncrophoenician origin, origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. This is the word of God. This might be a puzzling statement. Jesus is controversial. <laughs> and he's a controversial subject often because he proves himself to be so different than so many people want him to be, including myself sometimes. <laughs> if you know anything about Jesus, you're kind of all for him or all against him or you're ambivalent, which means you probably haven't learned much about him. Jesus himself described himself as so controversial that he'll turn a son against their father, a daughter against their mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, that he was so controversial that he could cause splits between people that are for him and those against him. Now, we've been moving through the Gospel of Mark here, and we found that there are people that are for Jesus, and there is a group of people that are really against them. And part of the group that's really against Jesus are those scribes and the Pharisees, right? Now, if we go to the very beginning of this was chapter 7, three quarters of the way down it, at the beginning, the Pharisees and scribes were indignant at Jesus' disciples because they were eating without ceremonially washing their hands first that they broke with their traditions. And Jesus replied to them as part of his reply. He said, they worship God with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. They substitute human traditions for God's truth. Jesus didn't fit their mold, did they? Did he? he these were the religious elite. These were the ones that thought they got to define who God is, and what God does. But Jesus didn't fit their mold. His followers didn't obey their, their human customs. He hung out with the sinners rather than condemning them. Rather than trying to avoid becoming ceremonially unclean, and he touched those lepers and became unclean himself. He taught and he modeled humility in service rather than self-righteousness. Worst of all, he called them out on their own hypocrisy. And that got under their skin, and he was at odds. Well, actually, when you look at it, Jesus as the Son of God is the ultimate model of what's right. So the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious people who thought they had all the answers were against Jesus. And in today's scripture, Jesus does like a triple whammy, He's coloring outside the lines that they had drawn for this is what people do who are faithful Jews. And so with a little apology to uh, Jeff Foxworthy, you know, we might be a Pharisee if we're more worried about what people think about us than having a clean heart. We might be a Pharisee if we spend more time worried about the sins of others than we do in prayer for our own. 
we might be a Pharisee if, if we think that everyone who disagrees with us is obviously ignorant and stupid. We might be a Pharisee if we hold on to that grudge, believing we are justified in it, at the same time claiming that Jesus forgave us for our sins and paid that price on the cross. So in this passage, Jesus is stretching those Pharisees to the breaking point. He is doing something he's, that is considered unthinkable. Jesus travels to a Gentile region. It's out of his way. Why would a good Jewish rabbi do something like that? And worse yet, now that he's there, he speaks to a Gentile. Oh, my goodness. And now speaking with a Gentile, it's not just a Gentile. It's a Gentile woman who's not his wife. Yeah, yeah, he was a little controversial there, wasn't he? But in this chapter, like much of Scripture, Jesus reveals a much broader understanding of God's will and of God's love than religious people of his day and maybe our day too. <laughs> Earlier in this chapter, Jesus blew the... Uh, Pharisees' dietary laws and traditions out of the water, making the point that it's not your outward appearance that makes a difference because the true things come from in. Jesus focused on the inner transformation of a person's heart rather than the appearance of what they do and what they say. In this passage, Jesus left the Jewish areas of Israel He's a Jewish Messiah. Why would he do that? To go to the Gentile region. And there, using God's power and out of love, he does something only God can do and casts this unclean spirit from the Gentile woman's daughter. And skipping ahead, Jesus goes to yet another Gentile region and teaches and heals there. But in today's passage, this outsider, the Syrophoenician woman, a pretty much a Canaanite Gentile woman, may have even worshipped different gods, had heard about Jesus. And something told her she needed to see Jesus. You read that there's an urgency. There's Nothing's going to dissuade her. But this Syrophoenician woman, this outsider, She's lifted up as the hero. She's the hero of this story. The person that didn't fit in anything is the one that Jesus lifts up as the example, the model to follow. It wasn't the scribes or the Pharisees who study God's law and go to amazing lengths to keep their interpretation of it and get around to bully and other people that they would do it too. It wasn't Jesus' disciples. This story is also told in the Gospel of Matthew. And in the Matthew account, Matthew 10, 25, it says, they try to get Jesus to send this woman away because they don't think this woman is on Jesus' agenda. But it's the woman, the outsider, who receives what only Jesus can give. She begs him to cast this spirit from her daughter. And Jesus has this really curious response, doesn't he? Jesus says, let the children be fed first. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And if you're scratching your head, you might be thinking, oh, he's calling her a dog. Because the Jews must be the children. And it does seem insulting on that level. But this woman knew something. She knew that all she needed was a table scrap. But there's something deeper here. Jesus is saying it's something really big. And we're going to have to do a little unpacking to unwind this. Because in um, Jesus talks a lot about bread in Mark 6. And um, got some listed up here. He sends the disciples out two by two. 
And he says, don't take a bunch of this other stuff. I'm taking extra clothes. I'm going to bring extra shoes and cloak. But don't bring any bread either. You've got to trust God to provide for you. And God's going to provide what? Bread. It's not much long after that that Jesus feeds the 5,000. And he feeds them with five loaves. What's loaves made out of? Bread. Loaves are bread, right? And two fish. Meeting the needs of thousands of people with an abundance of table scraps left over. They said it could fill 12 baskets of table scraps. Then, after Jesus' disciples are scared on the storm, Jesus comes to them walking on the water, and they can't, they're can't. they freaking out. They can't figure out what's happening. The Gospel of Mark tells us what was at work. It says they were scared because they didn't understand about the loaves. Boy, this is a lot of talk about bread, isn't it? Then here in chapter 7, when the Pharisees complain about Jesus' disciples eating with unwashed hands, what a lot of um, English translations leave out, including the version we just had up here, is it says they were eating bread. It's right there in the Greek, artos. They were eating bread with their unwashed hands that the Pharisees were complaining about. Jesus was teaching them, you need to understand about the loaves. This bread, even the crumbs of bread, seemed to be something important to understand. The bread that they had to go out two by two without, the bread that Jesus multiplied to be exceedingly abundant, that they didn't understand about the loaves, and then they couldn't, which was the reason they couldn't understand Jesus walking on the water. Bread becomes an image that Jesus is using and the scripture is using here of God's ability to provide and not just provide barely enough, but in each case to provide in abundance. Jesus knows full well, I believe, as he says this, oh, those children aren't going to go hungry. The children are going to be fed. But so are those that are outside of the family. Now, I've got little dogs, and <laughs> they, they probably get a little more than table scraps. But the point is, no one was going to go hungry if Jesus is serving the bread, right? <laughs> With Jesus, there's bread to spare, and this woman evidently has the faith to know it. Because not only is Jesus breaking the rules talking to this Gentile woman, she's responding to him. Smart, decisive. She knows what she needs. And she believes that Jesus is going to give it. From Matthew's account that parallels this one, the same incident saying, with Jesus saying, Woman, great is your faith. Great is the faith of this woman, not Jesus' disciples, the scribes, and the Pharisees. Great is the faith of this woman who's the outsider. Great is the faith of this woman who comes to Jesus, having only heard about him, believing and pleading that Jesus would do for her daughter what cannot be humanly done. Great is the faith of this woman who recognizes that God's abundance, God's love, God's heart, far exceeds human expectations. Expectations of what God can accomplish, expectations about what God would do, expectations about who God would invite, who God would speak to, who God would provide, who God would heal. So who are the people who come to Jesus? This woman did. She was in desperate need. When we realize that we need what only Jesus can provide, when our sins stand before us, we need to come to Jesus. People who understand that their life is a mess, boy, we better 
hurry up and get some of those table scraps. Because only Jesus can bring us out. We have more questions than we have answers. People, as we need someone bigger than us, a lot of times people who initially don't think they belong. But Jesus is the one that talks with them. Jesus is the one that welcomes them. Jesus is over and over the one that includes them. So as Jesus' people, what are we going to do? Are we just going to stand around? Are we going to stay in our own little circles? Are we going to bust out of those molds? Reach across some of those boundaries. Ministering in Jesus' name. Believing that if we understand about the loaves, we will worry about, can I do that? Do I have enough? Am I good enough? I don't know what to say. If we understand about the loaves, those things aren't an issue. We, if we get just a crumb, we're more than good. So what we do when people walk in our door, it was wonderful to hear from those people who recently became members about how welcome they experienced and felt like they became part of the family of God. And that's because you embrace them, you seek them out. You're kind, you're generous and compassionate. The question is, will we de demonstrate that we sit at Christ's table, that we understand about the loaves, and we have so much to give because it's not coming from us, it's coming from God. I love this story, and some of you probably heard it before. There was a young lady named Geneva Simpson who was part of this church and over time had moved and all. And Nancy ran into her in a used furniture store. And so one day she came by the church and she brought a bunch of her friends. And, um, you know, it was like 10 years ago, maybe a little longer, and goth was really in, so they got black lipstick, black fingernails, piercings, tattoos, leather with studs and stuff going on. And, and we had this great time. We were just sitting around chatting, talking, you know, with all of their friends. And um, as they were getting ready to leave, they go, one guy goes, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> because this idea really amused him. He thought it was the funniest idea in the world. Yeah, what would happen if we show up at your church some Sunday? And I knew the answer. I said, you'll get hugged. <laughs> and what a great image of what God calls us to do in even more difficult circumstances and choices than that. Who can imagine if Democrats hug Republicans, Republicans, Democrats? <laughs> all right, I know I'm pushing it too far, all right? <laughs> But not really. Because perhaps what's more important is what happens outside of here when it's not a Sunday morning. Will you reach across those lines to your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, people you cross paths with, people that sometimes you might want, otherwise want to avoid? Would you reach out to people you don't know like Jesus did, not waiting for them to come to the temple or church? Not waiting for them to come, but you're going to them. Even if it's a foreign place from your normal life patterns. Because the good news is if we understand about the loaves, like this woman, we know that there is more than enough of God's provision and love to go around. We will know that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. In fact, the, until we begin to understand about the loaves, these table scraps that are given to us, until we do, until we enter into God's abundance, we're going to be living in the scarcity of the Pharisees. That there's too little. We can't share it. When, in fact, that's what God calls us to share. It's not ours to judge who is worthy, who is not, who belongs, who does, who does not. 
who is in, who is out, because when we do that, we are just neglecting the very heart of God, substituting human infallible sensitivity and usually a huge dose of self-righteousness. But it's as we begin to give of our time and our resources, our patience and our love, which we can only do if we understand about the loaves, <laughs> understand the one who provides, the one who feeds, the one who accomplishes, the one who has the power strength. But as we begin to give of ourselves, it's only then that we really begin to experience the God who loves us, but calls us to be the one, as it says in Matthew 25, to welcome the stranger. As it says in Matthew 5, love our enemy, to pray for those who persecute us. To see this outsider, Syrophoenician woman, as loved by God, to learn from her example of faith, and to see Jesus' great compassion. The truth is, many times, the things that we think are sacrifice for us, that we are giving, or that we are serving, often turn out to be the very way that God most blesses us. You know, I so miss the opportunity we've had in the past before COVID of setting up a feast down in the Paramore. And I'd love twisting people's arms to get them to go. And they come back almost every time. And I say, well, how'd it go? And they go back up going, man, I, I thought it was, I wasn't going to like it. It'd be hot and sweaty. And, you know, you know about homeless people. But you know what? That was the best part of my day, best part of my week, that they went, they gave, they served. They encountered real people rather than a category. And that's the life to which God calls us. That's the kingdom that Jesus proclaims, is it not? That we have been saved not just for ourselves, but for the sake of Christ's kingdom. And as we gather at his table, there is an abundance to share. Amen.